Aloha. Mahalo, mahalo, I don't know. That Hawaiian doesn't translate into my redneck. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to New Life. I literally was last week thinking about some of you. I'm like, I haven't seen them in weeks. And it turns out I miss church two Sundays in a row, uh, which y'all, most of you probably don't need to worry about. <laughs> some of you miss two weeks in a row. Hmm. Uh, so if you don't follow me on Facebook, you should. We went to Hawaii for 12 days, uh, and we didn't post when we were out of town because people steal less stuff when when we when we don't post while we're out of town. So when we came back, my wife now, today's probably day five, day six. Are you posting right now? Okay. So later today, you'll get the post of what I did on day six, which was, was amazing and awesome, and I'm not going to tell you about it. You'll have to go watch us on Facebook, okay? <laughs> Um, so I went to Hawaii, which is kind of cool. It was not a dream of mine, uh, but was a dream of my wife since she's been a little girl. And I've been telling her we're going to wait till our 25th wedding anniversary for a couple of reasons. A, I could have more money. B, um, we wouldn't have any kids living at home, or that's the hope anyway. And we decided during COVID, it's our 23rd anniversary, to just see what kind of deal we could get. And so um, I'm Stegall, which means we talk about the deals we got. We got round trip tickets from Amarillo to Honolulu for 550 bucks. I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm cheap and chintzy and I like to talk about it. So uh, we had a great time and it was way good for me over there because hardly anybody's over there because everybody's scared to death. But we're back. Uh, we're glad to be back. I, I love taking a break and I also love getting back home to my church family. Uh, completely missed you guys. Next time we'll take you with us. And then we don't have to come back. A little tired this morning because uh, it's 5 a.m. my time. <laughs> my new time is their time. <laughs> and uh, it's 5 a.m. Now, a couple of things have happened in the world or things that I haven't talked about. So here we are. World news I need to respond to. Number one, this has been the best year the Dallas Cowboys have had since I was a child. I've been telling everybody this is our year. This is happening. It's happening. I say it every year, but this year the team's actually doing what I'm saying, and so this is great. Pray, oh, okay, no thumbs down in the back. What are you a Steelers fan? I won't. Oh, yeah, you better not. <laughs> and the Aggies won a game this year. <laughs> okay, number two. I I think we were talking. I went to women's Sunday school this morning long story. Uh, we were talking about the things that we learn or put into our hearts from church, and they had said something unique. I, I, it was probably Sue that said it, but it's funny. Some of the things we believe people believe is because they just don't say. There, there have been some omitted things like your grandparents just didn't say or your parents didn't say, and so you just assume what they believe. And so let's talk for a moment. I have not talked about this topic because it is so edgy and controversial, but here we go. Vaccinations. <laughs> Am I making you nervous? I'm going to talk about it. This is what's important for you to know. There are some things laid out in the Bible that are crystal clear, do's and do nots. Okay? The Bible is crystal clear, do this, don't do this, period, end of story. It's not, it's, it's not controversial, it's just that's what God said. There are some other things that God said I will tell you what I want you to do, and I may tell your neighbor something else. Now, here's the perfect story about this church. There was only one elder that has made it through the entire time of this church. There were some really turbulent times, and Alan Lehman and his wife were called by God to stay elders of this church during the turbulence. Everybody else left. And whenever I got here, he said, we were called to stay because we knew one day God would send new leaders, new, you know, things would change. And they were called what the Bible calls them the remnant, okay? God told other elders to leave. And so you might say, how is it that God could tell some elders to leave and other elders to stay? Because that's what God does. He, he's saying, we're trying to, sh trying to make, a, make motion here. We're trying to do things. And so he's going to release some. And he's going to have others stay so that there's a remnant that he can rebuild on, okay? And so it was a great conversation I got to have with Alan about that and very unique 
that some were called to do one thing, some were called to do the other. And so here's what I have to say about vaccinations. If God told you to take the vaccination, then you should. And if God tells you not to, then you shouldn't. And we need to respect each other as a people. I am sick and tired of the divisive, crazy behavior uh, having left uh, the state of Texas and gone out. It's like, I just, I'm, I'm tired of divisive division and divisive behavior and just the ugliness out there. And so when it comes to things that the Bible is not clear on, you need to do what you're convicted to do and, and live and let live. Think and let think and, and, and not worry about it. We spend so much time judging others on what God's called them to do that we're not doing what God's called us to do. And so whatever God's doing with that, just ease up on everybody a little bit. Decide for yourself and let's breathe. Okay? Was that better than you thought? Huh? <laughs> it is uncomfortable, but I think if we don't talk about it, we don't know where we stand and... I stand with whatever God's telling you to do, you better do that, and you need to do it quickly, whatever it is. Not, I mean, facts are not, I mean, about everything, about everything, about where you work and where you don't work and homeschool and not homeschool. I mean, just do what he told you to do so that he can line us up like the chessboard so that he can accomplish what he's trying to accomplish. Let's move into John chapter 1, verse 1, probably my most, uh, I, I probably share this scripture at this church more than any, because this is such a pivotal verse. I'm going to go a new direction today, but you need to hear it. John writes that in the beginning was the Word. Now, it's capitalized, Word, in your Bible, and it's Logos. And so it, it, it means in the beginning was the logic. This is before the logic, the Logos, even hit paper. Before the Old Testament was written, before the New Testament was written, the Word existed. Later, it gets written. But the logic, the, the, the lineup, the way things happen, the way God put things into order, the order. In the beginning was the order. In the beginning was the Word. Now, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. And without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Scientifically speaking, most scientists will tell you the fastest thing known to man is the speed of light, and that's actually almost true. There's one thing faster than the speed of light, and that is the retreat of darkness. Darkness has to move out of the way faster than light can get there. The word and light are all encompassed in one, and this scripture is talking about Jesus Basically, John's explaining that before everything was created, logic or the word, the word of God, the scripture, was already decided. And Jesus is the word. That sounds terrible, huh? Glad it's not me. The logic existed. Jesus was that. He was not an afterthought. He wasn't a later. He wasn't a, oh, what are we going to do now? He was always there from the beginning. He is the Word. Now I want to move to John 14. This is when Jesus is about to die, and he's telling his disciples, they know he's about to die, and he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, also believe in me. For in my Father's house there are many rooms, and if that were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going to that place to prepare your room for you. And if I go and prepare the place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, we hear this verse at, at funerals, okay? This, this is like the end cap verse. I say it out at the graveside or in the funeral because we want to talk about that there's, there's something else happening. There, there's more to life than what we have right now. Now, let's go to verse 5. Thomas then says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, let's just line this up real quick. John's telling us that Jesus is the word, 
And the only way to get to the Father is through the Word. Now, Jesus is the Word made flesh, and the Bible is the, the Word on paper with ink, but there's only one way. I used to go to a camp at Cedar Canyon when I was a kid called One Way Camp. There's only one way. We live in a world where Oprah will talk about wagon wheel theology. When that wagon wheel is that there's a big old wheel on the outside and there's an axle in the middle and all the spokes lead to one place. And I will, I will agree that wagon wheel theology is true in that all roads that aren't Jesus lead to the same place. It'll be warmer there. Jesus says there's only one way. There is no other way than this one way. Now, what's confusing about this to us is that we'll often think about, okay, there's only one way to heaven. And it doesn't say to heaven. Now, now the Father's in heaven, and that is there is only one way to heaven. But moreover, today, this afternoon, if you want to experience the Father, there's only one way. Jesus. You don't get to make up your own way. You don't get to do your own thing. Now, I love to travel, and I love to see different cultures. Uh, I've been to lots of places, and I like to experience that. I like to see uh, different belief systems, and I don't necessarily mean religions, just to watch that. And over in Hawaii, uh, we got to go to a luau, and they did the history of, of you know, the fire god and all that stuff. And, I, and I, I, that, whenever I say that stuff interests me, I'm not interested in following that. I just, I'm interested in seeing what people have made up over the years. When they don't know what to believe, we will make up what we believe and so those things interest me and I also love people watching so when I go on a trip like this I'm overstimulated all around me are new beliefs and new systems and new people and new things and new conversations and we get to hear what they're talking about at the table behind us and, and over to the side and what I realize after a trip like this is I get super comfortable in my wonderful community I'm always eager to come home because I'm comfortable in Dalhart. I'm comfortable in Dallam and Hartley counties. I'm comfortable in the Panhandle. We live in a bubble of freedom. We live in a bubble of values. And if you don't believe me, go to an airport that's not Amarillo. Just go. Uh, I don't want to tell you all my stories. I have repented. <laughs> not everything went my way when I'm out of town. Not everybody's kind to me. Not everybody's nice to me. You get out of here and you realize we live in this bubble. And it's a good bubble, and I'm glad that we're here. And my hope and my desire is the things that happen in our bubble can trickle out of this bubble because I don't think the only place on earth that God wants to be is the Texas Panhandle. Now, I do know he has an 806 uh, area code. If you want to call him locally, he's here. Uh, it's good, but going outside, you realize it's, it's not just the news that says it's a mess out there. It's a mess out there. It's a mess of belief. It's a mess of, of feelings. I think, I think uh, somebody said in Sunday school this morning, uh, Miss Mary said it, how crazy it is that we live in a world where you have to make a law to explain who should be playing which sport. That's craziness. It's, it's, it's nuts that we live in a world that's, that's so off kilter that we have to make laws for things that we believe to be common sense. And so uh, I want to tell you, I, don't, I didn't bring my Bible, I wanna, I'm going to tell you the story that happens in Judges 17. I would really like for you to go read this story in Judges 17. I'm not going to read it today, I'm just going to tell you it's a very short chapter. And it says that there's a guy named Micah. And Micah steals money from his mom, silver as it were, steals the money, and then mom finds out that the money's gone and asks for it back, and the son brings it back. Now, the mom is so excited that Micah, her older son, her, I mean, it's a, he's a grown man's son, and he brings his money back. She's so excited that she says, we're going to melt it all down and make an idol. And so what you're seeing is a strange scenario where you have a son that's done something pretty unsunly, and then he brings it back, and mom's excited, like, oh, look, change has happened with him, and so they decide to melt it down and make an idol, and Micah asks one of his sons to be the priest over this new idol. He, it says that he, he makes an ephod. I mean, he, he makes up this fake religion in Judges 17. He, he makes up something that's not real. He's like, I did something wrong, and then I did something good. Now mom's excited. Now we're going to make an idol, and I'm going to make one of my sons be a priest 
so that he can show everybody how this idol works and, and bring them in for worship of this idol. And then it says, it, it has this verse in 17, I think it's 17.6. This is, this is such an important verse for 2021. It says, in those days, people did what was right in their own eyes. In those days, people did what was right in their own eyes. After it says that, so verse 7 comes back and says, And then a man that was a Levite, I think he had come from Jerusalem, and it might have been Bethlehem, but a Levite's coming through town, he's got nothing, and this man is so elated, Micah, he says, Hey, we're so excited to be around a Levite. Now, if you know the story of the Levites, God plucked them away from all the rest and said, You guys will be the priest. You guys will be in charge of worship. You guys will be in charge of taking care of the sacraments and doing all the things that are going to bless God. We're not even going to give you land because you are going to, you're going to have, be over everything. So this Levite comes to town, and Micah says, holy cow, no pun intended, I am so excited that you're here. If you'll come live with us, I'll give you food, I'll give you clothes, I'll give you shelter. You come live with us, and you can be our priest. And then Micah ordained this Levite to be the priest of his God in his tabernacle, doing his own thing. And then that's the end of the chapter. It's, like, it's just like this, little, it's like this little snippet inside of Judges, and I'm, I'm reading that going, wow. I really was just going to get the verse that said, and people did what was right in their own eyes, and there's a whole story wrapped around it. It's whenever I decide what's right and wrong, and then I decide what's worship. And then I decide how we're going to do that and how we're going to bless and how we're going to pray. And I decide all these things. And at the end of it, the man's so boastful. He's so excited. It says that God must have blessed me by sending a Levite to be the priest of my little thing. He mistakes this, this traveler for God's blessing on his wrong worship, on his wrong belief system, on his wrong mess. But what's cool about this chapter, and, and I, I don't remember, I, th I think it was Matthew Henry, one of the commentators wrote on it, that this guy was completely sincere. I think one of the holes we have in 2021, I think we can all agree that people do what's right in their own eyes. I think what we have trouble agreeing with is that those people are not evil. I think some would say when we get around people that do what they want, when they want, how they want, and they believe what, you know, it's like we're, we're going to do our own religion often Christians look at them and think they're evil and that's part of our problem we then we, we tag them as evil and, and we're just like ah and then and we have conflict we have conflict we push against them we fight uh, there's a gurgle we, we don't like messing with them we don't like praying for them or anything because we think they're evil well, this commentator writes about Micah in um, in Judges 17 and said Micah is completely sincere not evil ignorant Huge difference between evil and ignorant. If you don't believe me, go to lunch, pick two different people, tell one of them they're evil, tell the other they're ignorant. <laughs> email me what response you get. Now, some will tell you that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Okay? You young folks over on the young folk roll, that's an old saying. I don't even know what a handbasket is. Probably more like a grocery cart. So, Some would tell you the world's going to hell in a handbasket. They look around and they're like, it's never been like this before. And I would say, hold on, go read your Bible. It's always been like this. We go through seasons of worse and less worse and worse and less worse. But there's been sexual immorality since the beginning. There's been murder since the beginning. There's been riots and burning people and stoning people and, and, and self-righteousness. I mean, there's been messes since the beginning. It's always uncomfortable for us to live in a world that's depraved. Uh, we, it, it's hard for us to live in a world that focuses on sin. It's hard for us, but it's not new. And when you read things like this, I think we can learn from scriptures on, you know, what, what's my move here? What, what am I supposed to do? I want you to know Micah was completely sincere about what he wanted to do and what he thought God was blessing. I think that's the craziest thing about the whole story is he takes this Levite coming and goes, well, looky there, God's blessing it. Don't you know somebody that's living in sin? 
Don't you know somebody that's worshiping false gods? Don't you know somebody that has it wrong, and they're so sincere about it that whenever something good happens, they say, looky there, God must have blessed it. God must have anointed it because, you know, hey, if God didn't want me doing this, why would he let me keep my job? If God wouldn't, didn't want me doing this, why would I keep getting blessed? And so they mistake something positive that happens in their life for God's anointing on it. And the reality is Micah has just decided to ordain his own. He, he didn't want to follow the Bible. He didn't want to follow what's righteous. He didn't want to follow what God asked for. He simply just wants to do what he wants to do the way he wants to do it and wants to feel good about himself. He's completely sincere, but he's completely wrong. Now, let's flip the ship a little bit this morning. I want to think back through times in my life that I've been completely sincere and I've been completely wrong. Maybe you're a little like me. What's healthy is being able to call it, be able to look back and go, there was a time that I thought what I was doing was righteous, that I thought what I believed was right, and I was wrong. Sometimes we do that by adding Jesus. I remember being a young Christian. I was in Pampa. I remember it like it was yesterday. Went in Pampa, Texas, and it was over on the Catholic church sign back when church signs were cool uh, and they had the little letters that you'd go write stuff, and it said, just add Jesus to your life. And I remember going, oh, no, 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 no. That's pantheism. Adding Jesus is a problem. Jesus didn't say, add me to your life. He said, lay down your life and come live my life. It's dangerous to just add Jesus. It's dangerous to just, like, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and do a little bit. I'm going to worship a little bit more, read a little bit more, so forth and so on. He said, lay down your life, pick up your cross, and come and follow me. And I remember a time in my life that I was just adding Jesus. And the cool thing about that is I can admit I was completely sincere. And I was completely wrong. Sometimes, you and I, we use Jesus as an argument. When we don't like what somebody's doing or when we disagree with somebody. In fact, I've heard we've had some conversations with family members on both sides of, of the vaccination topic. And one will tell you, well, if you're a good Christian, you won't. And the other will tell you, if you are a good Christian, then you will. And what we find is that you're adding Jesus. You know, it's like you've decided what you think's right. You've decided what you want to do. And in order to control me, you're going to say, and that's what a good Christian would do. I've actually been in conversations when I'm doing things that God's asked me to do. And often it's controversial or, or we're ha having conflict or having to hold somebody accountable for some time. And they'll look at me and go, and you call yourself. Did it come back? There it is. Do you call yourself a Christian? And that's just a control mechanism that we all could be guilty of using to have somebody do what we want them to do. And what's sad is that we're completely sincere when we do that. And we're completely wrong. WWJD, uh, we were watching Medea the other night, and that's what they were, they were like. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not against the WWJD bracelets, but it, but it turned into anytime somebody was acting in a way you didn't like, you'd say WWJD. Uh, it, it was just like calling them out or throwing it out there. And, and I want to go ahead and, and answer that question. What, what would he do? What did the Bible say? What did he do, right? If I come in here one morning and I start throwing tables around and running people out, and if you're like, what would Jesus do? And I'd say that, <laughs> exactly that. Uh, or if uh, he, was, he would call people out, he would, he would have arguments with people, and then you'd be like, what would Jesus do? And then it's like, well, we should be reading and seeing what, what that means. Now, back to... Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. We, we're living in, in, this, in this mess. We live in a world where we have to work with people that who knows what they believe. Uh, and, and we find ourselves isolated. We find ourselves alone. We find ourselves not knowing what's right and what's wrong. What do we do? How do we adapt to this? What do we change? We live in a society that changes rules and laws as time goes on because Europe's changing rules and laws. It's like, well, now that's socially acceptable. We know more science this, science that. And, and it, gets, it gets to be this, this slippery slope as to what are we supposed to be doing. Sometimes we use Jesus to control others. I said that in, in the arguments. We add Jesus. It's just, 
we got to go back to the verse, verse and go, okay, if in the beginning the Word was with God and was God and everything was made through God and He is the light and He's the light of the world and He's life, He's all these things. And then the only way to get to the Father is through the Son. All of a sudden it starts lining up that everything, everything, not just salvation, everything is to come through the Word. Even the things I'm not comfortable with. Even the things that I don't agree with. And there are some things that biblically we get asked to do that I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to just say I completely disagree, but I'm like, ah, I don't like that one. Let me, I want to think of a good, I didn't, I didn't write an example down, but I, forgiveness. I have a hard time forgiving when you've been ugly. It, it, especially if you're a family member and you've been super ugly, you know, it's like, eh, I don't, that was nasty, that was bad, I don't, I don't think I want to forgive. And then Jesus tells Peter, seven times 70? And that just makes me want to keep a book so I can, once I get to that number, I can be done. There are some things I get asked to do, like, like turn the other cheek. What, uh, uh, Medea was so good. I love Medea. She's like, oh, it's specific. She's like, they hit one cheek, you give them the other cheek, and when they get ready for the third one, you whoop them. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's just waiting on two punches before she jumps in. There's things we get asked to do. It's like if they steal one thing from you, you're supposed to give them something else on top of that. So that, that's the stuff I'm talking about. It's, it's biblical, and if it's biblical, I'm called to do it. Uh, that was the one that hit me early on as a Christian. I had something stolen, and then I saw the person that stole it from me, and I went back and asked for it back. And then I found in the Bible, it says, if you find something that was stolen from you, do not demand it back. And I disagree with that one. But I'm obedient. That, that, I want you to hear that. Just because I disagree with something doesn't mean it's not God's word. Doesn't mean it's not truth. And that's the world we live in, Judges 17, where we do what's right in our own eyes. We say, okay, I'm going to take, I, I want the good stuff God's laid out there. I want the good things God's asked us to do. But these other ones, yeah, that was old timey. That was old fashioned. That was archaic, you know. And, and at what point am I smart enough to sort through what God didn't actually mean or what got old or what's socially wrong? We live in a mess. When people are doing what's right in their own eyes. And what we need to be doing, instead of adding Jesus or using Jesus as an argument or using Jesus to control people, what we need to be doing is using Jesus as a reference point. I love when a kid calls and like, okay, I'm on my way home. How far is it till I get home? And then I have to say, well, I need to know where you are. I, I, if I don't know where you are, I can't tell you how far it is to get home. And if you're asking how far it is to somewhere, I need to know, are we leaving from Dalhart or are we leaving from Borger? We need a reference point. And in a Judges 17 world, our reference point is how we feel. Our reference point is what we want. Our reference point is what blesses us or what we value. What Jesus has asked us to have is a reference point that is him. It's easy for us to look around the room or look outside in the world and go, oh, man, they're way off and make us feel better about us being a little bit off. We need to be using Jesus as a reference point, not as rhetoric. Now, let me go back to John 14, 2, and let's read it again with this idea. So, Jesus says this in 14, 2. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. And if that were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare that place, I will come back and take you with me, that you may be where I am. You know the place, or you know the way to the place I'm going? Thomas says, we don't. And Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so if he is the word made flesh, then not only is Jesus that speaks to me, the way, the truth, and the life, but Jesus that I read about in the Bible and the whole word altogether is the way, the truth, and the life. And we've gotten away from letting the word of God be the way, the only way that gets us to the Father. 
for instance, if you're on a, if you're on the basketball board, and you're like, man, I just wish, I wish God would be present at our meetings. Well, the answer to that is asking, are we letting him be the way, the truth, and the life of this basketball board? I know that stuff seems kind of off or maybe arbitrary, but I'm, I'm like, that's, that's real. If he's the way, the truth, and the life at basketball or at school or at my business or in my family, you know, wherever I'm at, if he's the way, the truth, and the life, he'll be present at that place. Again, because the world's such a mess, we can look at ourselves and go, oh, okay, well, compared to them, I'm doing good. Well, that means they're the reference point. There is no compared to them. The reference point is compared to the word. Compared to the word, am I doing, acting, feeling, thinking, am I operating like Jesus has called me to operate? Now, personally, I'm not open-minded. Uh, John Barrett my, one of the guys I used to work for said, be careful about being open-minded. Your brain will fall out. I'm not open-minded because I'm Bible-minded. Again, I don't agree with everything in the Bible. Don't agree with it. Obey it. I, I, I can't say that enough. I obey it. That doesn't mean I like it or that I think that's best for me or that that's fun for me. I don't like that at all. In fact, here's the other one that I really don't like. It says, if someone sins against you, go to them. Someone commits a sin against you. I don't like that at all. I'd rather go to 13 other people and tell them what you did. That's easy. What's hard is going to somebody. I'm open or I'm not open-minded. I'm Bible-minded. And I want you to know that the Word of God is my reference point. Even though I miss the mark or that I don't always hit the reference point or I don't always get where I'm going, that's the reference point. And know that Jesus is the living word of God. So they're, they're the same. They, they don't separate from each other. The written word of God and the word of God in flesh are one and the same. Jesus will never ask you to do something that the Bible told you not to. They never contradict each other. I talked to the staff this week about what I'm now calling Google apathy. One of the things that's happened in the last 20 years that's really awesome for us is Google. In that, if I have a Bible question, I can go Google it and then find reference. I mean, I can find stuff. And so in my early years, I had a big old strong concordance and several Bibles. And I had to read because if somebody came into my office and asked a question, I need to be prepared to answer that question. Well, now our staff doesn't have to be prepared because we can just turn around and go click, 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 and then look it up. And there it is. Well, the problem with that is that we as a society are not necessarily digging into the word like we used to because we only go to it when needed as opposed to letting the word get in us all the time. And so what happens is we end up at crossroads in life. And if you haven't been studying the word and you haven't been reading the word and you haven't been inundated with what God's saying, you may actually be at a crossroad that you don't know what the answer is. And you may go a direction and find out later, just like I did when I demanded those glasses back. I know you were being a cheerleader that day. Oh, you go get them back. And, yeah. and so there I was getting glasses back. And then I get in the Word and find out that it said, actually, don't do that. I needed to have offered him my jacket that day. It's always quiet right there because, I mean, like in our society, we're like, yeah, no. <laughs> Can you imagine actually going over and going, hey, I know you stole my glasses. Here's my jacket. Have you done that? No. Oh. <laughs> You're like, oh, here, here's my bullet. <laughs> here's my 911 phone call. You know, and, and Jesus is saying, like, be these crazy people that just bless. And, I mean, just like they do this stuff. And we're going, I don't know about that. But then when somebody does something that we're uncomfortable with, we'll call that out and go, the Bible says don't do that. And so there I was, not knowing what the Word said. I did something. I come back and I see what the Word says, and I have to modify. And so we need to be in the Word so that he can be dropping this stuff in us. I always remember my favorite movie as a kid was the uh, Short Circuit with Johnny Fobb. And he would, he would just get a book and go and scroll all through it, and then he'd memorize everything in the book. And I'm like, yes, I didn't like reading, and that would be the way to do it. And then when Matrix came out, they just plug something in and download it. And God's saying, you need this in you, but the way to download it is to hear it, to be reading it, to be in it. And because of Google, I really think the church has stepped away because we're, we feel comfortable that when we need to know, we'll ask. 
And the problem is, we probably needed to know some stuff that we didn't need to know. Well, here's what's cool about all of it. Everything I've done that's been unbiblical in my Christian life has been sincere. Just ignorant. I've done some sincere things that were just ignorant. So what's the solution as we leave this morning? Here it is. I'm telling you, we have to start with me, with yourself. You've got to say, okay, in my life, in my heart, in my thoughts, in my practices, is Jesus the way, the truth, and the life? Meaning, the way, is he the direction I'm heading? Is he the truth, meaning is he the reference point? Do I make decisions on, well, I can see, I, yeah, I know the Bible says this, but for our government, I get it, right? That means he's not the truth. Is he the way? Is he the truth? And then is he the life? Is he, is he the breath? Is he what gives you life? After I get me, now it's got to be my marriage. In my marriage, is he the way, the truth, and the life? And whenever I'm good at me and I'm good at my marriage, now in my family, it gets real easy for me to ignore the way, the truth, and the life, and for us to ignore the way, the truth, and the life, but to raise kids going, hey, y'all need to be reading the Word. You need to be doing the Word. You need to, be, you need to quit bothering me, and you need to behave better, and you need to, well, until I'm living it, it just falls right over their ears. Me, my marriage, my home, and my church. How many times have you been at church? not really worried about how you're doing or how your marriage is doing or how your family's doing, but at church, you judge how I'm doing or you judge how somebody else, you know, I know why y'all sit in this section because you don't want to sit with these guys. <laughs> and we look around going, oh, man, they're not living. They're not in the way. They're not in the truth. They're not in the life. Well, don't, don't worry about who's sitting next to you till you get things going at home. And once it's in me and my marriage and my home and my church, now... Let's take it to work. After we take it to work, let's take it to our county. After we take it to our county, we can take it to the boards we sit on. And after we take it to the boards, we take it to our state and we take it to our country. I think any of us could turn on Fox News or any news channel this afternoon and judge everybody that doesn't live in Dallas and Hartley County. We could watch it and be like, oh, I'm so glad. So glad I'm not them. I'm so glad I'm not living out there. I'm so glad I'm not in that mess. I'm so glad that... We're not those kind of people. And when we do that, we miss out on some of the greatest God experiences you'll ever have because he's not asking you to worry about all them. He's asking you to let him be the way, the truth, and the life in your heart. Will you bow with me? Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you will show us how to let you be the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, that you would, would just be in the center of us and gravitate to the outside, that we would be full of you, that we would be fulfilled, that we would be walking in the right way, that we would be living in the truth, and we would be living life to its fullest. Father, I ask for the members of New Life that you would just fill them with life and with blessing and that you would just cover them with grace and mercy, that you would answer prayers and you would hear, uh, hear their prayers, Lord. You would move in these families. Lord, I want to be I want to be part of the most blessed family that there is and the blessed, most blessed church that there is in the most blessed state that there is. Father, we pray for our governors and our leaders, and we ask you to show them the way, show them the truth, show them the life that we can live in the world that you've called us to live in. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Y'all have a good week.